President Terry, dear audience. So I will talk to you about inverse problems. And it's uh, my professorship is in applied mathematics, but inverse problems is my is the main topic of my research. And first of all, I need to define what an inverse problem is. So, so in order to do that, I will first define what's an ill-post problem, and after that, uh, first an ill-post problem, after that an ill-post problem, and then inverse problems will be a subset of these ill-post problems. So, what are inverse problems? Uh, first of all, um, we need to define the well-posed problems, and this was done by Jacques Salomon Hadamard, probably in the early 20th century. And uh, at this point of time, mathematicians were trying to define what are the problems that one should consider. So there are some problems that doesn't seem to fit in the mathematical framework, and others that fit well, very well into the framework. And Hadamard defined well-posed problems by by these three conditions. So first of all, a problem is a well-posed. If it has a solution, then the solution needs to be unique. And those are quite easy, easy things to understand. In order to have a good problem, you need to be able to solve it uniquely. But then there's also this third condition, which says that solutions should depend continuously on the data in some reasonable topology. So this topology world can, world can be replaced, for example, by in some reasonable sense or in some reasonable metric. So the whole idea is that when you have a problem and you have some data, and if you modify this data just a tiny bit, then also the solution should only be modified by a tiny bit. And there's also this kind of uh, ill posedness in this last condition. So there's this word reasonable. So word reasonable is different for different people. For some people, for example, really pure mathematics and something that is reasonable is totally unreasonable for, let's say, for an engineer. So in a sense, this definition of well-posed problem is actually ill-posed. But let's anyway stick to this because there is nothing, nothing better out there. So then the ill-posed problems. So it's quite easy to understand that if you have in the world, you have lots of problems. So a way of defining ill-posed problem is to take all the problems and then cut out the well-posed problems. So in this kind of mathematical jargon, this would be something like the ill-posed problems are the complement of the well-posed problems in the space of all problems. And probably somebody else has said or written down something similar, but this is the way that I would phrase it. So one could argue that, argue that most of the real-life problems are actually ill-posed. So uh, well-posed problems arguably only exist in this kind of mathematical idealization. So, so in real life, you can't really sort of have all these conditions satisfied. So for example, there might be m multiple solutions. And most definitely, you can many times define, uh, have a problem where the solution doesn't depend continuously on the data. OK, that's something that is up, up for discussion. But anyway, that's kind of my opinion. And then the inverse problems are a subset of these ill post problems. So a short way of putting the definition of inverse problem is that they are a task of, or an inverse problem is task of finding a cause of a known consequence. So quite often in the world, there's some kind of direction of causality. So there's some kind of cause, and then there's a consequence. And when you are solving a forward problem, you are trying to work your way in the direction of causality. So uh, you are going to the direction in which nature would naturally somehow go. And in an inverse problem, you are doing the opposite. So you are trying to find the cause, a cause of a consequence. So you are trying to work your way against somehow the stream of causality. And Actually, the way that usually, some of you have probably seen this, but the way that I usually demonstrate what could be an example of inverse problem would be to have a glass of water and then drop a ink, drop of ink in this glass of water. Now, the forward problem would be to uh, compute somehow what would be the uh, ink distribution in this glass, let's say, five minutes after this moment. And there are actually quite efficient computational methods to do something like this. And you can even argue that, that it's quite a safe, stable problem. 
The inverse problem, on the other hand, would be to have a look at the class five minutes later and try to infer what was the initial ink distribution in the class. And it's intuitively quite acceptable that this kind of problem is really ill-posed. Because, for example, if you wait for 24 hours, the ink has distributed probably homogeneously in the class, and there's no way of saying where the original drop of ink was. OK. And if you have these kind of problems, then the thing that you should do is to use all prior and expert knowledge about the feasible solutions. For example, you can make this really relevant ink in the water class problem more feasible by, for example, knowing somebody tells you that there was only one drop of ink in the class. So that gives you extra information, because probably it would be really difficult to tell whether there were two smaller drops close to each other or one large drop. So if you have this kind of extra information, you should always incorporate that in the solution algorithm when you are solving an inverse problem. So if this actually, if I would be lecturing a course on computational methods in inverse problems, this would be the thing that I would ask the, the students to remember after the first lecture. So always take into account all the prior, prior and expert knowledge about the feasible solutions. OK. Then I have this kind of practical example that is encountered quite often. Those of, who you, oh, those of who, you, who were at my defense, they know already this problem, but this is encountered by many children worldwide before Christmas. So for example, you have somehow, you are a child, you have the knowledge of, of where your parents have hidden the Christmas presents. And now you sneak in there and you have a, some, it has your name on, on, on it, this box, and you try to get you some information about what's inside there. And of course, you have some prior information. For example, you know that this is kind of a small box, so I hoped for a pony, so it's probably not in, in here. So, so it, it's something small. On the other hand, you have probably some prior information about the income of your parents. So you can, you can deduce that it's probably nothing really expensive. But, but then that's probably not enough. You can shake the box, and there's definitely something inside, but I still know, don't know what it is. But when you are really an engineer, then you have some measurement, measurement equipment with you. So for example, a flashlight. So you can turn a flashlight on and try to illuminate this box with a flashlight and probably see some kind of silhouette of what's happening inside. And by combining this kind of measurements to the prior information that you have, for example, you might have written some kind of list of things that you hope, hope, for, hope to have. You, you might get an idea, combining this prior information to the measurements, what's actually inside here. And this isn't actually a research question that we are tackling, but, but it could well be because it affects lots of people worldwide, really. OK, to get, get into something that is really relevant to the research that we are carrying out in this research group of inverse problem, problems at the Department of Mathematics and uh, Systems Analysis, consider having some physical body. It could be this kind of present, but it could be also, let's say, the human torso. And then you place electrodes on the boundary of this object, and then drive currents between different electrodes, measure the corresponding voltages, and try to deduce information from this kind of boundary current and voltage measurements about the conductivity distribution inside the object. And this is called electrical impedance tomography. So this is an example of actual research. And this kind of modality is called electrical impedance tomography. And the task is really to deduce information about the interior of some physical body from, from boundary measurements of current and voltage. And there are some pluses and minuses to this kind of measurement modality. So first of all, it's, it's inexpensive. It's really like it's not as simple as having a voltmeter, but it's not far from that. So it's really sort of compared to MRI, for example, this is sort of nothing, the price. Then it's non-ionizing and harmless in all senses. So you can, for example, do some online monitoring with this kind of equipment. So you can have some patient in some hospital bed, and you have a belt of electrodes around the torso and try to figure out what's happening with the heart and the lungs. So of course, you can't do something like this with X-ray tomography machines. 
And it's also movable because in principle it could be like a belt of electrodes. Of course, uh, you haven't seen this kind of uh, modalities in use in hospitals, so there must be also some minuses. So this is a highly ill post problem. So it's uh, definitely sort of one of the most ill post problems that are actually worth, worth studying. So it's, it's nothing, uh, it's really, co really far away from well post problems. Then it's also non-linear, which makes it even more difficult. For example, X-ray tomography problem is linear. So this is non-linear. And finally, a question that might be the most important, important problems uh, in, in the way of actually using this in real life is that this kind of measurement with electrodes on the boundary of a body is really sensitive to, to uh, mismodeling of the measurement configuration. Okay, is there any hope? Actually, there is. Within the Bayesian framework, we have been able to ask the question, can we reconstruct the conductivity, the boundary shape of the object, the electrode locations, and even the contact impedances at the, at the electrode object interfaces simultaneously? Okay, I must say that there are also other ideas out there, but of course I can't give the proper references here because I don't have enough time. But anyway, we stated this kind of question, maybe we can reconstruct all the parameters, and the requirements for doing this was to have some mathematicians to compute some Fresse derivatives, the derivatives of the measurements with respect to the boundary shape of the object, with, with respect to the electrode locations, the contact impedances, and so on. And once you can differentiate with respect to something, you can try to optimize with respect to that, that parameter. Then we also needed physicists with measurement devices, and then lots of program code that was provided by graduate students mainly. And doing this, we could combine mathematical analysis that looks like this. I won't go into details over here, but anyway, this is from one publication uh, that actually has some computational value also. So we comp compare this kind of mathematical analysis to properly modeled measurements. So these are two water tanks from University of Eastern Finland. So there are some electrodes on the boundary of the water tank. And then, in principle, you can put something inside there and try to figure out what that thing is that you already know to be, know, know to be there. And by combining mathematics with measurements, we actually get a function in reconstruction algorithm. So over here, this reconstruction of the conductivity inside this uh, water tank, there's a piece of metal over there, piece of plastic, uh, that conductivity was reconstructed simultaneously with the exterior boundary shape of this object. So we started with an initial guess that is a disk. And then by this kind of iterative algorithm, we got this kind of, this kind of reconstruction. So it seems to function. You can at least infer whether some, the patient has swallowed a reinforcing paw or something like that. So it's not yet really practical, but maybe in the future. And there are some more reconstructions. You should pay attention that these are really good. These are really bad. That's the idea of the article. So here we didn't estimate the shape of the boundary. So this is what you get if you think that that's a disk. So in medical applications, it's important because, for example, the cross-section of a construction worker is probably different from a small child. So you need to be able to do something like this. Okay, and that was all. Thank you. <laughs>